Bible. Is it written by God or man? The Proof of Prophecy. 911, what's your emergency? <gasps> you need to come quickly. My husband, you need to help him. Ma'am, ma'am, calm down. What seems to be the problem? My husband, I, I think he had a heart attack. He grabbed his chest and he fell over and he's not breathing. <laughs> The numbers are staggering, and despite health clubs, medical advances, and healthy diets, there are no guarantees that you or I will live to see tomorrow morning. It's this kind of thing we don't really think about very often, and it's the very thing that prompted Charles Spurgeon to once say, be often where men die, because when we're around death, it has a way of putting life into its proper perspective. So here's my question to you. If you were one of those people that were going to die in the next 24 hours, would you go to heaven? Are you certain? You know, I know there's millions of religions out there, and they all have their theories, but if, if, if you could ask God, what would he say? And is there really a way to know for sure? Listen to this. All scripture is God-breathed. That's written in the Bible. So in five simple words, the Bible makes this claim, that its author, its source, is God. So if we want to know what God says on this subject of heaven and hell, eternal life, and lots of other subjects, the Bible says God tells us by and through what he had men write down in this Bible. But of course, that raises the obvious question, why should I trust the Bible? How can I know for sure that the Bible really is what God said? Men have written all sorts of books that claim to express God's ideas and opinions. So what makes this one so special? Well, the answer is this. While there may be hundreds of books claiming to speak on behalf of God and to explain the road to heaven, only one, the Bible, has proven itself to be the infallible, irrefutable Word of God. Do your own research on this. It's easy enough to check it out. What I'm saying is either true or it's false. And I'm saying very clearly, very plainly, that one book, the Bible, has categorically proven itself to be written by God. And it has done so in thousands of different ways. This program is going to look at just a handful of those ways. For example, did you know that the Bible has predicted thousands and thousands of events, many of them hundreds of years before those events ever even occurred? And all of them are the kind of events that in no way could have been manipulated by people or circumstances arranged to create the impression of a divine prediction where none actually occurred. <laughs> The Bible proves that it alone was written by God and not merely by man because it alone has made thousands of incredible predictions with 100% accuracy. Imagine a person who could predict 
the exact time and date of plane crashes, the names of people who would die at a very specific time in a very specific way, births that would take place, giving the times and dates and names and weights of the children 10 to 15 years in advance. Imagine a person, if you can, that could predict wars and describe them in frighteningly intimate detail before the countries even showed signs of aggression towards one another. And then that person also had the ability to cite, in writing, cities that would be destroyed and hundreds of other impossible to predict events in the future. And all of them came true. Would you believe that person? Would you believe it when that person told you the next event? Well, sure you would. Yet, no one person has ever done this with perfect, infallible consistency with thousands of predictions over thousands of years. But that is exactly what the Bible has done. That's why in Isaiah 46, God said this, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times. What is still to come? I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. And chapter after chapter, verse after verse, God in essence says this, do you really think there are a lot of genuine choices out there about religion and how to go to heaven? Try asking those other sources who claim to know the truth to do what I've done in the Bible. Ask them to, to predict the future, not once, not twice, but thousands of times. And make it a condition that they do it perfectly, flawlessly, and in such great detail that no man could ever have known these things. And then you will see, I am God, and there is no other. Only I can predict the end from the beginning. The Book of Mormon can't do it. The Quran can't do it. The writings of Confucius or Buddha or anyone else can't do it. No one else ever has. No one else ever will. And then you will know which book I wrote and which ones I didn't. Another reason that we can trust that the Bible is the only book ever written that was inspired by God is that no other book has ever made predictions with anything even close to the 100% accuracy of the Bible. In fact, did you know that only two other widely accepted religions even attempt to make the claim that they can predict the future? The two other religions are Mormonism and Islam. But what is interesting is that the Islamic Quran only makes vague and general predictions about events that will happen at the end of the world. So if they're wrong, it will be too late to affect their credibility. Mormons have also made dozens of predictions about all kinds of events in several of their publications. In 1835, Joseph Smith predicted that the coming of the Lord would take place in 56 years, which would have been in 1891. Obviously, his prediction missed that mark. On May 6, 1843, they predicted that unless the United States was to redress the wrongs, committed upon the saints in the state of Missouri, the United States government would be overthrown in a few years. Over 150 years have passed since this prophecy, and the United States government has not redressed any wrong done to the Latter-day Saints by the state of Missouri, and the federal government is still intact. On April 17, 1838, they predicted that David W. Patton would go on a mission for God. Six months later, in October 1838, David W. Patton died. The only problem is, in each and every case, the predictions were either made well after the events took place, or the events never came to pass at all. No other book can predict the future with 100% accuracy, because no other book was inspired by God. And if you read one of the hundreds of passages in the Old and New Testament that predicts the future in graphic detail, often hundreds of years in advance with details that can't be misinterpreted or manipulated, you begin to realize something. You realize that no man could predict such things. And you also realize that there's a reason those incredible predictions appear in the Bible. God put them there on purpose 
so that you and I could know and trust that the Bible is God speaking to men, just like it claims to be. And so it can disprove all the other scams, the frauds, and the charlatans, the wannabes. No other book can make that claim honestly. That is why the Apostle Peter said, Above all else, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at just a few of the irrefutable proofs that the Bible is God speaking to man. First of all, let's talk about what a biblical prophecy is. A biblical prophecy is a prediction, but it's much more than that. It's no ordinary prediction because a biblical prophecy is a prediction spoken by man but inspired by God. And it's very different from your average prediction in another very important way. It has identifying marks that make it impossible to have come from any human source. There are four criterion of legitimate prophecy. You see, the world is full of false prophets, inaccurate predictions, and even accurate predictions for that matter. But only divinely inspired prophecy can meet these four standards. First, it can be proved that the prediction was made before the event actually happened. Second, there's a large time gap between the prediction and when it actually comes to pass. Enough to prevent any possibility of someone maybe making an educated guess based on the signs of the times. Third, the event itself must be something extremely unlikely to happen. In fact, so unlikely, so specific, that coincidences or fulfillments of predictions that are very general can easily be ruled out. Fourth, the person or persons involved in the event are unable to manipulate the fulfillment of the event itself. In other words, they couldn't, even if they wanted to, make it happen themselves. Let me give you a quick taste of just one of the hundreds of examples of prophecy in the Bible. And keep in mind that this biblical prophecy meets every single one of the criteria that we just showed you. <laughs> First of all, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah about a man named Cyrus. And he says this, He is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Now while on the surface to the casual reader of the Bible, that appears to be a relatively insignificant statement. When we look a little bit closer, here's what we discover. The book of Isaiah was written in approximately 700 B.C. Virtually no one disputes that. It's been proven unquestionably. But what makes that passage in Isaiah so amazing, however, is this. Isaiah is talking about two things as if they had already happened, and yet they hadn't even occurred yet, and wouldn't occur until 100 years later. His second prediction stated that, one, the temple and Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And that hadn't even been destroyed yet. And two, Isaiah names the name of the man who would rebuild them. And he hadn't even been born yet. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 586 B.C. That is more than 100 years after the book of Isaiah was written. They were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, which the Bible also predicted. And... 150 years before he even ruled, Isaiah calls the man who would rebuild the temple by name, Cyrus the Persian, ruler and king. Now, do you understand the significance of all that? No man could have predicted such an event so far in advance, and no man could have manipulated the circumstances to make it appear to be divine prophecy. Only God can predict the future so flawlessly, so dramatically, and only the Bible has those kinds of genuine prophecies. But let's look at a second prophecy of the Bible, the prophecy of the destruction of Tyre. Now, the city of Tyre was the beautiful capital of Phoenicia, just north of Israel. Part of the city was on the mainland, and part on a beautiful offshore island. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 26, the prophet Ezekiel delivers this message from God to Tyre in 586 B.C. 
I am against you, O Tyre, and I will destroy you. And if the prophecy ended there, it would have been significant enough because this city was well protected. It was virtually indestructible in many ways. But the prophecy did not end there. God, through the prophet Ezekiel, made seven very specific, virtually untemperable predictions about exactly how Tyre would be destroyed. Prediction number one. Tyre would be defeated by a group of allied nations led by the huge army of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, coming from the north. Prediction number two. God would use this huge army to so destroy Tyre's walls and pull down her towers. But scripture actually records God as stating through the prophet Ezekiel that he will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. Prediction number three gives this bizarre yet eerily accurate detail. She will become a place to spread fish nets. Prediction number four. Her settlements on the mainland will be ravaged by the sword. That will be the specific method of destruction, not any of the other favorite methods of King Nebuchadnezzar's armies. Prediction number five. The armies, according to this precise prediction, would plunder Tyre's wealth and loot her merchandise. They will break down her walls and demolish fine houses and throw her stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. Next comes this stunning prediction, which holds an unanswerable challenge out to all skeptics of Bible prophecy. Prediction number six. God said this to Tyre. You will never be rebuilt, for I the Lord have spoken declares the Sovereign Lord. And finally, prediction number seven. You will be sought, but you will never again be found, declares the Sovereign Lord. Despite the certainty of the existence of the city of Tyre, no matter what efforts will be made by the world's greatest archaeologists, no trace of the ruins of Tyre will ever be found. Only proof that she did in fact exist. That is an irrefutable prediction that certainly puts the credibility of the Bible on the line. For if the ruins of Tyre ever could be found, it would undermine the very authenticity of its claim to be written by God. Those are the predictions. Very specific, very tamper-proof. And here's what went down. And if you're a skeptic, I challenge you to check it out for yourself. Check out the times, the dates, the places for yourself. Check as often as you like. Check any and all reliable sources that you want. Encyclopedias, history books, archaeological records, you name it. Check them all, but here's what you'll find. History records that a king named Nebuchadnezzar attacked the city of Tyre with his huge and mighty army. He did so because they arrogantly refused to surrender. Most other nations quickly and voluntarily surrendered when they saw the strength of Nebuchadnezzar's forces. But not Tyre, because they themselves had a powerful navy with a military fleet of ships that few could compete with. And so when Nebuchadnezzar came after them, despite the prophecy of Isaiah that they would be destroyed, they mocked him and relied on their own strength. But God, regardless of what Tyre said, said, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will destroy you and make you bare as a rock, and your people will all be killed by the sword. So Nebuchadnezzar came against Tyre and destroyed the city early in the 6th century BC. But some of the people managed to escape by using their navy ships to escape to the islands of Tyre, just off the coast of mainland Tyre. And most of the biblical prophecies were unfulfilled. And if the critics that exist today were present then, and surely there were critics against God's word then as well as today, they must have scoffed and pointed to the inaccuracy of the fulfillment. But verse 3 says, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will destroy you, and I will tell you exactly how I'm going to do it, with seven very specific, very detailed prophecies. And it will happen. And indeed happen it did couple of hundred years later. Just listen to a quote from not some Bible commentary, but the Secular Historical Encyclopedia Britannica. 
Alexander III, in his wars on the Persians after defeating Darius III at the Battle of Isis in 333 BC, marched southwest towards Egypt, calling up the Phoenician cities to open their gates. The citizens of Tyre refused to do so, and Alexander laid siege to the city. Possessing no fleet, he demolished old Tyre, the mainland, and with the debris built a moat 200 feet wide across the straits, separating the old and new towns, erecting towers and war engines at the far end. Now at the port, Tyre's navy was giving a good fight and preventing Alexander the Great from finishing them off. So what did he do? Exactly what God said he would do in the first prophecy in verse 3. He allies with many other nations who have navies and comes against Tyre. Now listen to what secular historian Philip Myers has to say about what happens next. And keep in mind, if you would, that this man is not a biblical commentator, not a theologian, just a historian recording the facts in a historical textbook. Alexander the Great reduced Tyre to ruins in 332 BC. She recovered a measure from this blow, but never regained her place she had previously held in the world. The large part of the site of the once great city is now as bare as the top of a rock, a place where the fishermen still spread their nets to dry, which were the precise words used by God in the book of Isaiah to describe the events in the first place. And to top it all off, remember, prophecy number seven, God said, I will bring you to a horrible end and you will be no more. You will be sought but you will never again be found. Do you want to disprove the authenticity of the Bible? Find the remains of Tyre. Good luck. They don't exist. Archaeologists have searched for years and found nothing. And the Bible frequently makes that same kind of challenge to any skeptic. City after city that's been destroyed in the Bible, and God consistently makes the same remarkable claim that they will never, never be rebuilt. Ever. And every time that kind of statement is made about each city, from that point forward in history up to and including today, those areas lie barren. Each one stands as an unarguable testimony against the skeptics. No one has ever rebuilt those cities because God said no one ever will rebuild them. In 1994, the following three specific predictions were made by the supposed world's greatest psychics. Next year, there's going to be a great earthquake that is going to turn Florida into an island. Whoopi Goldberg is going to leave acting and join a convent. There will be a national lottery that will cut taxes in half. Florida, Whoopi, and taxes are still here. In fact, Gene Emery, a science writer, has more or less made a career out of examining or perhaps a better word would be exposing the tabloid prophets slash psychics. And in his words, they may be a hoot to read, but they've no more ability to predict the future than you or me. How was the universe created? Is there really a God? Can man become God? For thousands of years, man has pondered countless questions about his origin, looking to the stars and planets for answers. Out of the science of astronomy grew the controversial practice of astrology. Taurus, financial success is yours. Consider investing your money now. Be cautious in traveling. Make sure that your life insurance policy is up to date. Many astrologers feel up to 80% of our destiny is determined by the planets under which we were born. Author and researcher John Weldon says he believes the acceptance and influence of astrology in everyday society is perhaps beyond what most of us would believe. Uh, approximately 30 to 40 million Americans believe in astrology to some extent. It's used by Fortune 500 companies. It's increasingly used by uh, what we might term New Age psychologists. It is uh, taught in some universities. It has, of course, influenced uh, even the White House. And more and more people seeing this kind of credibility are turning to astrology. 
For 16 years, Karen Winterburn was a believer in astrology and for most of that period made her livelihood advising people according to the astrological charts. Uh, I thought this was something that was putting me in touch with God, who I perceived at the time to be an impersonal, cosmic source of energy. The more serious danger is that as you become more and more involved, you become more and more hooked and interested in what is this power that is making this work in my life and the lives of my clients. And then you begin to seek the power behind astrology. And for me, that led into becoming a channeler. You may go to a channeler, you may, but somehow you are seeking the spiritistic power source behind astrology. Karen says it was obvious to her the charts were not giving her the answers to the questions she and her clients were seeking. And that is not unusual. An extensive five-year study of thousands of predictions showed those considered the best in the astrological field were, at best, only 10% accurate. Astrology is condemned in the Bible because it is a form of divination, which Deuteronomy 18 condemns and says is an abomination to God. At the first, it starts out seeming so good. It seems that all this is from God. It seems that this is the truth. And there are endless testimonies from people that thought what they were getting involved in was good, and then it turned sour. And when I saw the kind of, of webs of deceit and shambles that my life was in, put that next to the idea that I was becoming God and pretty far along the path, the whole thing just seemed totally ludicrous. Then I was right back there at a square one with a pile of sin, 16 years worth of untransmuted karma, staring at me. One of the most precious realizations for me at the end of all this was that in having the person and the power of Jesus Christ in my life, I have the real. And we as Christians have to remember that and realize that, that what we have is what everybody else is looking for in these alternative counterfeit sources. We have the real source of power. We have the real source of enlightenment and source of life in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And yet, people spend billions to hear what these con artists have to say. Now, do you know who these psychics are that you can call on these 900 numbers? They're people hired off the street, so today they're world-class psychics. But yesterday, they were sales clerks or teachers or unemployed drifters, for that matter. Typically, they're given a couple of hours of what's called cold reading training, which basically teaches them enough to pick up on some hints that you might give. And then they're thrown to the phones as experts with just enough so-called ability to convince somebody who wants to be convinced that they can predict their future. Michael de Nostradamus, better known by his Latinized name, Nostradamus, is revered as one of the greatest prophets in history. Many say he had the rare ability to predict future events. But where did he get these premonitions? And just how accurate were they? Nostradamus is a household name. Hollywood made a motion picture on his life. Thousands of books have been written about his incredible predictions. Tabloids quoted. Let's now take a close look at these incredible prophecies as interpreted from French into English. The invention of the radio and the light bulb. When the animal is tamed by man after great efforts and difficulty begins to speak, the lightning so harmful to the rod will be taken from the earth and suspended in the air. The animal in this quatrain is the radio and the lightning is the light bulb. America actually named in prophecy. The rule is left to two. They will hold it for a very short time. After three years and seven months, they will go to war. Their vessels rebel against them. The victor born on American soil. The fact that Nostradamus actually named America in prophecy loses its mystique somewhat when one understands the prophecy was published in 1568 and America was discovered back in 1492. 76 years earlier. In fact, this 15th century globe of the known world proves that America existed at least 50 years before the prophecy was published. The naming of Napoleon. I'm going to teach you how to interpret one of Nostradamus's prophecies. This is the famous prophecy 
when Nostradamus actually named Napoleon. This is in Century 8, Quatrain 1. Poor, nay, Oleron will be more of fire than blood. Of course, that doesn't sound like Napoleon. So that it does, firstly, we'll have to ignore the fact that poor, nay, Oleron are actual names of towns in France at the time of Nostradamus. Second, we have to move around the letters in the three towns. Here is how to do it. One, swap the poor with the nay. Two, drop the y from the nay. Three, discard two o's from Oleron. Four, also drop the r from Oleron. And finally, join what's left of the three town names together. There you have it. That almost sounds like Napoleon. Wow. According to Edgar Leone, this deranged rearranging was first dreamed up by the imaginative Tournay. He certainly was imaginative. At best, such interpretations are ridiculous. At worst, they're deceitful. And yet Satan is so clever because he creates these false versions of the genuine so that he can raise doubts about real prediction given by God's legitimate prophets. You see, when people see the lack of credibility in false prophets and predictions, they tend to generalize that no true prophecy or prediction is possible. You see, God did ordain prophets who could predict the future with notable differences from the counterfeit versions. For example, God's true prophets were always right 100% of the time. Try to find that track record on one of those 900 number astrology lines. Secondly, as we showed you a bit earlier, God's true prophets predict events that were highly unlikely to happen. The prediction could be proven to be made in advance of the event. The event could not be manipulated and fulfilled by the predictor himself and there was substantial time between the predictions and their fulfillment to prevent any guesswork based on the signs of the times. The reliability of predictions made in the Bible and the reality that they really came to pass can be checked by any high school student with a computer or an encyclopedia. The problem is it's easier to be a doubting Thomas who never really bothers to check the facts, especially when there are so many frauds out there. In the time we have left, we're going to take a look at just eight predictions. But as we'll see very shortly, the odds of any man fulfilling even eight of the 456 predictions about the Messiah are so astronomical that anyone who has fulfilled even eight of them will be indisputably the predicted Messiah. Here are the eight predictions. Number one, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Check. Any casual reader of history or the Bible could tell you that. Number two, the Messiah will present himself to the people as king by riding into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. Check. That exact scene was fulfilled in dramatic fashion on April 6th, 32 AD, the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. Even more amazing is this third prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel predicts the exact day that Messiah will come. It was so specific that it literally stated it would be 173,880 days after the day the king announced the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And moving forward in time, 173,880 days, you arrive at the only historical scene that would possibly fit the description. The day Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Number three, check. Number four, the prophet Zechariah predicts that the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Check. 500 years later, Judas Iscariot did exactly that. Number five, the prophet Zechariah also predicted that the money used to betray Messiah would be thrown back into the temple and refused to buy a potter's field. Check. That's exactly what happened to the money originally given to Judas. Number six. Isaiah announced that Messiah would be innocent, accused of a capital crime, and yet he would say nothing in his own defense. Check. 
That, of course, was fulfilled in the trial and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Number seven, Isaiah also describes Messiah as an innocent man who would be treated like a common criminal and yet bury in a rich man's tomb. Some 700 years later, Joseph of Arimathea, a local wealthy Jew, provided a new tomb for Jesus' body to be buried in after he was humiliated and put to death on the cross. Number seven, check. And finally, number eight, Psalm 22 accurately and vividly describes and predicts Messiah's death would be by crucifixion 700 years before crucifixion was devised as a method of torture and execution. Check. Now that's just eight of the 456 prophecies predicted and described in the Bible of impossible to manipulate events in graphic detail. But what do most people today do with this information? Most of them, for starters, aren't even aware of its existence. Many of the others, made cynical by the counterfeits that Satan deliberately uses to distract them from the and undermine the genuine, they ignore them and never check the facts for themselves. Others say things like, it's just a coincidence. Well, Professor Emeritus Peter Stoner, professor of science at Westmont College, had his graduate students examine and calculate the probabilities of prophecies coming to pass in any one person. Professor Stoner discovered that for just eight prophecies to be fulfilled by one person, the odds would be one in ten to the seventeenth power. One with seventeen zeros. But unless you're a mathematician, that kind of number doesn't mean very much. How likely is it that something that is 1 in 10 to the 17th power will happen? Here's how often. First, imagine all land on seven continents covered in white, one and a half inch square tiles. Then paint one tile with a red X on the bottom where it can't be seen. Now, picture a person spending their whole life traveling every inch of the seven continents the odds that person would bend down and pick the tile with a red X on the bottom are the same odds of just eight of the prophecies randomly being fulfilled by any one person. For any one person to fulfill just 11 of the prophecies, the odds are 1 in 10 to the 63rd power. The number of all the electrons in every star, in every planet, in every galaxy, in the entire universe. There are 456 detailed prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. It's incontrovertible proof positive that God exists, the Bible is His Word, and Jesus is the promised Messiah. You will meet Him someday, either as your Savior or as your Judge. The question is not, is He the Messiah? The question is, is he your Messiah? My friends, this is fact, not fiction. So now you do know. Now you know that the Bible is the Word of God, and not just a book written by men with their own opinions. So there are no more excuses. So what do we do with that information? Well. Let's go back to our original premise today. Within the next 24 hours, 6,429 people will die. Some will go to heaven, some to eternal hell. Well, you say you don't believe in hell. Well, here's where our newfound information comes in handy. Because apparently, God believes in hell. As a matter of fact, he mentions it in a general sense over 420 times in the New Testament alone. For example, in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48, Jesus says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to with two hands go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched.
know that despite the modern notion of many people today that there is no hell, the Bible speaks of it over 420 times. Jesus himself, love incarnate, spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Why? To warn people, and because of just how horrible it will be for those who go there. Hell will be unlimited in intensity. Imagine the pain of a third degree burn victim. That pain is limited. The pain of hell will be unlimited. Hell will be unrestrained in the attack of men and demons. Here on earth, God restrains their attack on people. Otherwise, we'd all fall prey to the Charles Mansons and Jeffrey Dahmers of the world. In hell, there will be no such restraint. People will be under the unrestrained fury of other wicked men and demons for all of eternity. Hell will be uninterrupted in its misery. A human being who suffers on earth from a painful wound or sickness can sleep or faint or find temporary relief in medication. And there will be no such reprieve in hell. Hell will be unending, forever. What depth of depression, rage, hopelessness and sheer horror must a soul sink into knowing that after one billion years they are no closer to relief. Hell will be utter darkness, no light, no love, ever again. So not only did Jesus teach about the reality of hell, but he made it clear that we ought to pay any price we can to avoid it. It's that horrible. So what does the Bible say about who will and who won't go to hell? Well, first of all, it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. Proverbs 14:12. There's a way that seems like you're on the right path that leads to heaven, and, and the whole time it leads to hell, to eternal separation from God and love and light and all the goodness that God is. And that wrong way that seems so right, usually these days, goes something like this. I'm basically a good person, or I do more good than bad, or I go to church and I give to charity and I'm religious, or I try to keep the Ten Commandments, or... God is kind and he'll forgive me. It seems right compared to other people like murderers and rapists. It sounds noble. And there are a lot of man-made religions that teach those kinds of things, but they all lead to hell. The Bible also says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's Romans 3.23 and 3.10. And the reason it says that is because all of us have sinned, not just murderers and rapists. In God's eyes, we all come short of earning heaven. Because even though man, or more specifically Adam, was originally made in the image of God, once he sinned, that sinful nature was passed on like a family disease to every other person born afterwards. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Have you ever lied? I told a half-truth, an exaggeration, a... A white lie? Of course you have. And by definition, that makes you a liar. It doesn't take a certain number of lies to qualify you for that distinction. It only takes one. Have you ever had an impure, lustful thought when looking at another person? Well, Jesus was crystal clear on that point. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So that makes you an adulterer. You see, it's a heart issue. It's not only your actions, but your intentions. Jesus also said, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Have you ever been angry with someone Jesus says that it's the same root sin as a murderer so what's the point you say well the point is this the Bible which we've already proven is to be God's words not men's is very very clear if you've ever lied ever lusted in your heart if you've ever been angry at someone anyone the penalty for that is judgment hell you may be well respected as a judge in the community, a, a highly paid lawyer, a moral churchgoer, a family man, or you may consider yourself to be a good person. 
But the Bible says you are no different in God's eyes than a murderer, a thief, or an adulterer when it comes to the issue of your eternal destiny and of heaven and of hell. So if you were to stand before a just and holy God on the day of judgment and appeal to your own track record or how often you went to church or how nice or how good you've been or even to God's nature as kind and loving because he's just and holy, the Bible says he will surely give you the sentence you deserve. Eternal damnation. In a word, hell forever. No appeal, no change of sentence, no extra chance, no parole, if you will. You might be concerned with the fairness of that. Does a murderer receive the same punishment as a, a man who lived a basically good life, at, at least as people describe a good life? Well, your sense of fairness will be glad to discover that no, they won't both be treated equally. They'll both go to hell, but there are degrees of hell. The torment will not be bearable for anyone who goes to hell, but it won't be the same for everyone either. Worse sins will receive worse torment. <laughs> it's not much comfort, is it? That's why the Bible also says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. There's a big, broad road that most people are traveling. That leads to hell. And they're convinced it leads to heaven, and it doesn't. That broad road includes myths that men tell each other that make themselves feel better, like God's merciful, so he'd never judge me if I have good intentions. But God says to enter through the narrow, small gate that only a few will find in this age of being politically correct and tolerant of all views and religions and all roads, that's a radically different opinion. But then it shouldn't be surprising that God's ways are different than man's ways. God is perfect. Man is imperfect. God is loving and merciful. But he's also just. So he will condemn anyone who does not enter through that free but very narrow gate that he specifically provides. And the Bible does not apologize for the fact that there is only one way. In fact, it becomes very clear when we understand it that this one way, this one gate, is not only wide enough for the whole world, but that it's far more than any of us deserve. What is it? What is God's only acceptable way? What is the gate, the gate to heaven? Well, the Bible tells us that this gate is not a what, but a who. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. So the Bible doesn't say, go ahead, pick any religion you want. Come in any way you feel is right. No, the Bible says, and again, let me remind you that we've already established that the Bible is God speaking, not a person's opinion or a religion. The Bible says Jesus is the only way, because only Jesus was God made in the flesh. Only Jesus was born of a virgin. Only Jesus lived a perfect, loving, sinless life. Only Jesus earned heaven. But instead of accepting it, he hung on a cross and allowed his loving and just Father to pour out his holy wrath on him for your sins and for mine for the sins of all the world so that we may go to heaven and only Jesus rose from death to life three days later conquering death and sin and paying the wages of sin for us only Jesus paid the price because only Jesus God in the flesh could pay the price for the sins of the whole world when Confucius or Buddha or Mohammed or a church or a religion or a Day of Atonement can do that, then there would be another way. But there isn't. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So the question remains, how do you enter this gate? How do you go to heaven? How can you be sure? 
Well, maybe some who are watching right now are still thinking, you know, I'm really not such a bad person, or I still don't believe there's a hell, or I still don't believe God will judge me. Well, to you, my friend, I have nothing else to say. But maybe right now there are others saying, I admit I've sinned. I have no way to earn heaven. I know in my heart that if I appeal to my own track record or, or to a religion or to a church, I will surely receive what I deserve. Hell. Is there no hope? Well, that, my friend, is where the gospel comes in. Gospel means good news. If what we've heard so far is the bad news, then what we're about to hear is certainly the good news. And to you, the Bible says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. That's from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you believe and trust with all your heart that Jesus is God, and that by hanging on the cross, Jesus paid for your debt by his death, and his raising from the dead. And it's not your religion, not your works, or anything else that will allow you to enter heaven. Then the Bible guarantees you by the word of God and the promise of God, you will be saved. Romans 10.13 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But you should also know this. James 2.19 says, You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. In other words, even the demons knew Jesus died and was raised from the dead, and that he is God. But they didn't trust him to pay for their sins. A person who believes, really believes, won't just believe with their head. They'll believe with all their heart. And that person will repent, which is a fancy word for change their mind. They'll change their mind about the sins they've been committing. The lying, the alcohol or drug abuse, the sexual promiscuity, the, the sins of attitude like anger and pride and irritability. They'll stop calling them bad habits or lifestyle choices, and they'll start calling them by their real name, sin. And they'll repent and turn away from those sins and toward God. In other words, a change of heart will lead to a change of mind about sins and what they really are. And that will lead to a change of behavior. If you want a new heart, if you want eternal life, and if you want the power of God in your life to change and turn away from sin, and to know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven for certain, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your King, your Savior, your God, and you will be saved. Let's stop right here and pray a prayer. Together, you and me. And for the sake of those who desire to be saved and are willing to turn away from their sins as God grants them strength, let's go and beg for, for God for His forgiveness right now. To all the other blessings you've, by your grace, given me the air that I breathe, the life that I have, the acts of kindness I've done, the times I've sought you in prayer or in the Bible or at church, all of which I see now were drawing me all along. Please add this. Let me be born again. I believe Romans 10, 9 and 10, which says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Lord, take away whatever you want and whatever seems good to you. My reputation, my health, my family, my money. Only give me this. Let me be born of the Spirit. To become your adopted child by your word that promises that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 and Romans chapter 10 verse 13 for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved if you've 
prayed that prayer, call the number on your screen right now and we'll send you a free Bible and some information that explains in greater detail some of the things we just talked about along with some other free gifts that will be a helping hand in the weeks to come. Or if you have questions or you'd just like to talk to someone, give us a call at that same number. Eternal Life speaks not just about the length or quantity of life forever and ever, but the quality of that life, even here and now. And that's why Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. And if you're honest, apart from Christ, life has been a, a quest to fill a void that we all have inside of us. Some try to fill it with their careers, some try parties, some try sexual encounters, alcohol, drug abuse, buying a new car, or a house, or some clothes. Some have tried marriage, or having kids, or bodybuilding, or athletics for that matter. But that void always comes back sooner or later. But Jesus stands above those empty pursuits which are all meaningless apart from the right relationship with God and cries if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture has said streams of living water will flow from within him you can have that relationship with Jesus today if you haven't already prayed that prayer go to him and ask him he's gracious and kind and compassionate you'll never be disappointed and if you have just committed your life to Christ, find a good church, buy a Bible, and read it, and obey what it says. May God bless and keep you. Nine one one, what's your emergency? If the subject of this program has touched your heart, take the time to do an in-depth study on your own. To assist you, we've put together a comprehensive list of some of the very best books, audio and videotape teachings that address this subject. If you'd like a free copy of that list, or if you'd like to purchase a videotaped copy of the program, just visit our website at www.crosstv.com or call us at 1-877-CROSS-TV. <laughs>